welcome everybody to the Wild Neighbors series. Um, this is our Backyard Bugs talk. Um, so this is a, a partnership between the city and the county Balcones Kingdom Lands Preserve. Um, and we're really excited to offer the second um, online version of it. We had one last month um, talking about bats. And this is a series that we hope to offer um, about once a month. Um, and we're interested to hear what you'd like to hear about, what you'd like to know more about. Um, this began as an in-person series where we would um, listen to an expert about any number of topics from dark skies to helping to create backyard habitat, things that might be of interest to people who either live close to the Balconies Canyonlands Preserve um, or count pieces of the BCP as some of their favorite places in Austin like I do. Um, so we're certainly interested in um, speaker suggestions or topic suggestions that you might have. Um, a little bit of housekeeping before we move forward. Um, we'll ask that everybody keep their camera off and keep themselves muted um, throughout so that we'll be able to hear our speaker, Mal Bu, talk about um, backyard bugs um, and all kinds of entomology. Um, we as staff will turn our um, cameras off as well. There's staff here from uh, Travis County BCP and Austin BCP. Um, and we'll just come back at the end to help with the question and answer. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that in just a moment. Great, and we'll get started on just a brief intro to what the, the BCP is. Um, so this is a colorful map of the Balcones Canyonlands Preserve. As you can see, it's really a patchwork of so many different partners coming together um, to protect this habitat. Um, and so on this screen, you'll see City of Austin in bright green, Travis County in uh, purple. And so these are the, the two largest land managers in this group of partners, but there are so many more from the LCRA and the Nature Conservancy the city of Sunset Valley has a small piece, of course, um, the Audubon Society and uh, private land managers as well, as well that have entered into this partnership. Um, the whole point of uh, the Balcones Canyonlands Preserve is um, to protect habitat for endangered species while allowing Austin to develop. So um, in the 1990s, the golden-cheeked warbler and black-capped vireo were listed as endangered due to habitat loss. Um, the same areas that these birds um, depend upon as their only uh, breeding ground, the place where they, they make nests and have young, are the same place that we find so attractive um, for the rolling hills and the closed canopy woodlands. Um, and so it's been important to both protect habitat um, and allowing that protected habitat to mitigate for development of other areas that could serve as habitat. Um, Around the same time that the black cap vireo and golden cheek warbler were listed as endangered, there were also um, many karst invertebrates, so um, cave bugs, that were listed as endangered as well. Um, and since just about all of Western Travis County, everything in dark blue, um, is potential habitat um, for golden cheek warblers, um, there was the decision made to um, to protect a portion of that habitat, to manage it as best we can, to support as many breeding pairs as possible, um, and to allow um, the rest of that land um, to potentially um, be developed through a mitigation process. Um, so you have to apply for a, a permit in order to um, develop in that part of the county. Um, and you know, by protecting um, over 32,000 acres of land, um, since 1996, when the preserve was established, um, certainly it has protected um, these species, uh, the neotropical songbirds like the golden cheeked warbler, the black cat vireo, which was um, delisted um, in 2018, um, as well as 27 species of concern um, and our eight karst invertebrates. And so not only does the preserve directly protect those species. Um, it also creates this umbrella of protection for um, all kinds of living things um, that we 
hold dear where we live that kind of make our outdoor space what it is. Um, and in addition to that, it represents some of our favorite places to go to hike and to be outside. Um, and so some of those are Hamilton Pool and the Barton Creek Greenbelt, um, even Mount Bunnell and, and parts of, um, of Emma Long Park like the Turkey Creek Trail. Um, so, so many of the places that we love um, and value as a place to be outside um, are really doing the hard work of creating that umbrella of protection, protecting water, acting as carbon sinks. Um, and this series is really a, a way to help understand what we can do, what small actions we can take um, that can bolster and continue to protect uh, the small amount, relatively small amount of habitat that is protected compared to our overall potential habitat in the county. Um, and so we're really excited to share this um, with you and, and to focus on insects today. Um, at the end, uh, we'll do a question and answer. So if you have a question um, throughout, um, I'll encourage everyone to keep themselves muted all the way and with their video off all the way. Um, but if you have a question, you'll see um, a place to chat at the bottom of the screen. Um, you can click on that, ask your question, um, and Jer Jeremy um, from Travis County will be able to ask those of Val as we get to the end. Great. With that, we'll get started. I'll turn it over to you, Val, just a second. Okay, so our talk today is going to cover 80% of animal species. We're going to do it one at a time, so it's going to go real fast. No, I'm just kidding. Um, because insects and arthropods are so diverse and there are thousands and thousands of species around here, we pretty much spend the time learning groups of them. And I need to get my control. I'm not able to access it yet. There we go. Okay, bees are not insects. I'm going to start with the arthropods that are far from insects as we can. So they're very common though, and a lot of people think they're bugs or insects, but these are actually crustaceans. They're related to shrimps and lobsters and um, Pill bugs will turn red if you cook them. Centipedes are another kind of arthropod, but as you can tell, they have way too many legs to be insects. Um, the cent these are all from our area too. Um, the little ones can't hurt you, but things like the big one, which is about eight inches long, <laughs> is and you can buy these online because they are popular with hobbyists. Centipedes are predators and they have venom and so they will bite. Um, they have one pair of legs per segment. If you want to keep one as a pet, they like raw hamburgers. Millipedes might seem to be very much like centipedes, but they're actually not. They're in a whole different class. Millipedes have two pairs of legs per segment. They're scavengers, and so they can't bite you or anything. Um, they might smell kind of bad, but that's their defense. They can also curl up in a little spiral and centipedes can't do that. Of course, a big portion of our arthropods are arachnids, and that's the group that includes scorpions. We have two species of scorpions here in Austin, and the top one is the striped bark scorpion. That's the one that's so common that people see on their ceilings all the time. <laughs> all arachnids have eight legs, and if you look closely at scorpions, it looks like they have 10 but those claws at the front are actually just mouth parts and they use them for catching their prey. So all scorpions have a stinger at the end. The stinger there is nothing like that of a wasp stinger. It's main, this one is mainly for defense against predators. These are some of our other arachnids that are not spiders. Um, sometimes it's easy to mix up harvestmen or daddy long legs with spiders um, because, but these have no venom, they can't bite you, they don't produce silk, so they can't make a web. Um, and you know, most of the time you'll see these in big groups, whereas you don't see spiders like that. And of course, other arachnids include ticks, which are carry diseases, 
and little tiny predators like pseudoscorpions and velvet mites, um, which are actually very good at pest control because they eat things like insect eggs and aphids and things like that. Then, of course, the main part of arachnids that everybody knows are the spiders. And we have quite a nice variety around here. Um, there's some of them make webs and others don't, but they can all produce silk. And almost all spiders do have venom, but there are only a couple that are considered dangerous for humans. Um, most of the spiders, in fact, all spiders use their venom to digest their prey. Um, okay, the difference between, I'm, um, I'm still getting all the people that are in the waiting room and it would help if somebody else can handle those. Yes, Johanna and I were just chatting about that. It won't um, allow me to let them in now. If you're able to hit admit all, that would be very helpful. Uh, okay, where is it? I don't see it. Okay. Okay, anyway, the difference between a spider and an insect counts body parts and legs. <laughs> And in this case, these two, when they're crawling around, they look very similar on the ground. One is a mimic of the other. And the one that's the most dangerous is at the bottom. It's a velvet ant. And that's actually a female wasp. And they have a sting that gives them the common name of cow killer. <laughs> they can't really kill a cow, but supposedly it hurts very badly. <laughs> so the little spider actually mimics the velvet ant in order to stay safe from predators. You will often see in a lot of insects and other arthropods the colors of orange, black, red, yellow. In, and this is called aposematic coloring. It's meant to warn predators to stay away. Um, somebody might mute all because we're getting other sounds. And I've lost control of my stuff now. There we go. Okay, um, what, now there are five big orders of insects. You can count and you can keep track of them on your hand. And there, we actually have about 25 orders of insects around here, but five big ones. So the first is Lepidoptera, and that includes butterflies, which are so well known that everybody can recognize a butterfly. And the moths. And now this is where it gets tricky because we have 20 times more moth species than butterflies around here. So we've got a species list of well over 2,000 species of Lepidoptera, most of which are moths. About 150 are butterflies. Um, with the moths, of course, come lots of caterpillars. <laughs> butterflies have caterpillars too, but there's some, so few of them that you can actually learn them. With the moths, if anything's not a butterfly caterpillar, you, won't, you might not recognize it. Also, there are no butterfly caterpillars that can sting or hurt us. Um, there are some moths that are potentially dangerous, one of which is the puss caterpillar, and the other is the buck buck moth. And these have some spines that have venom in them, and if you touch them, you'll get like a rash from it. Um, but most of the time, the best thing to do is if you see a caterpillar that has hair or spines and you don't recognize it, just handle it carefully. Don't grab them. So Lepidoptera has complete metamorphosis. It, it goes through, I'm, still, um, I'm still having to deal with the waiting room. Somebody else, please take that over. Um, the complete metamorphosis means that we have a larva stage that eats a bunch and sheds its skin a few times and grows. Then it hits a pupa, and then it turns into the adult. The complete metamorphosis is the most common way that insects develop, and that has to do with, um, there, out of the five big orders, only one order does not use complete metamorphosis. So now we move on to um, the next two orders are easy to mix up. One is beetles, and that's the coleoptera. This happens to be the largest order of insects that we know. Um, partly because it's been very well studied and there are just lots of species. So beetles include things like June bugs and fireflies and weevils and ladybugs and a whole bunch of insects that have only one pair of wings and the front wings are actually a shield over the, the body of the, the uh, insect. So, and beetles have chewing mouth parts which will differentiate them from 
the next group we'll talk about. Just a review of that complete metamorphosis. You almost never see the pupa and the larva of beetles because they're usually hidden. They hide those parts pretty well because they're big and juicy and good food. I don't think I'd want to eat one of these grubs, but if you were really desperate, it would be a good source of protein. So the other group that can be mixed up with beetles are the true bugs, which are hemiptera. And these are the ways to tell them apart pretty well. Um, there's the easiest thing to look for are diagonals. A true bug has kind of diamond shaped or triangles. And the, the beetles tend to not have those at all. And here is the big difference. Beetles have jaws. They can bite you, but they can't really stick you with anything. They have no stinger. They're never venomous or anything. True bugs have a sucking mouth part. And so they feed on liquids only. And that means they either take liquid out of plants or animals or other things. So they, um, they're definitely different in the feeding habits. And this is the big difference between them. Here are some examples of our true bugs. They include both predators and plant feeders. And some of them you'll recognize, like water strider, um, the leaf-footed bugs, is down here with that big flange on it. Uh, stink bugs and things, brightly colored ones. There's that aposematic coloring, um, milkweed bugs. And, and, and bugs are the only group that don't have a pupa stage. So they have what's called incomplete metamorphosis. When they hatch, they start off as a little teensy cute bug. They shed their skin, they get bigger. And instar is simply a stage they go through. So they keep shedding their skin, keep getting bigger and bigger, but then they shed one more time and they become an adult. Now they have wings if they're going to have them as an adult. Um, insects that have wings and can fly are invariably adults. So there are no immature insects that have wings. And so once, if you see something flying around, even if it's very tiny, it's an adult insect. The leaf hoppers and the tree hoppers and all these little plant pests are also in the hemiptera. They're part of the true bug uh, group. They are usually, they're all plant feeders, uh, aphids, scale insects, white flies. You get the idea that these are plant pests mostly, <laughs> but they're fairly interesting too. They're quite pretty. The only one that's big and makes noise are the cicadas. And they're in this group too. And we're just getting into cicada season now, so you'll start to hear them singing all the time and coming out. Um, they're very noisy insects. Okay, so that took care of two of the groups, the beetles and the bugs, which are easy to mix up. Now there's two other groups that are easy to also kind of confuse. One is the flies. This is diptera. They have one pair of wings, and it's that doesn't help you in identifying them. As you can see, these are all flies, even though some of them look like wasps and bees and other things. Um, these love bugs are flies, crane flies, mosquitoes, and then your typical looking, a blowfly. You know, so some of them do are easy to recognize. They look quite similar to the bees and wasps, and that's. Uh, there are a couple of ways to tell them apart, and this is kind of important because we're studying pollinators a lot. People have noticed that pollination is sort of important, and they're starting to want to recognize, okay, what's pollinating our plants? Well, you're going to have flies almost as often as bees, and in fact, bees are our most important insect pollinator, but flies are the second most important. And so these are a couple of ways to often tell them apart. But as you can see, they, all, they look quite similar. Here are a selection of our native bees. I didn't put the honeybee on here because the honeybee was imported from Europe. And most people kind of know what it looks like. Um, the main social bee that we have is the bumblebee, which is down at the center here. That's a bumblebee. Uh, they're just starting to get going this year. Um, we're, I'm starting to see the colonies increase, so we're seeing workers out. Um, so with bees and wasps, only the females can sting. They're the only ones with a stinger. 
the males don't have one because the stinger evolved from an ovipositor, which is an egg laying mechanism. And so the, the, as the um, bees are going around, all the workers are females. All the ones that can do you any damage are females with a stinger. And most bees don't use the stinger for defense, except social bees do. They are designed to protect their nest. So the other part of the group of bees and wasps is, of course, the wasps. There are five families of bees in our area. There are about 80 families of wasps. They are that diverse. And they include some of the tiniest insects there are. They can be less than a millimeter long. Then there are others that, of course, that are fairly large <laughs> and fairly easy to recognize. Ants are one family of wasps. They are the Formicidae. And so ants are all social. All those workers are females. And they, of course, don't have wings. The only time they have wings are when they're going to be a queen or a drone. That's the male. Um, the workers are all wingless. But we have a lot of different kinds of ants around here. Um, it's just they're hard to study or if you're not really paying attention because they're all really pretty small. Okay, out of after the five big orders, there are some other orders that are well known, but they don't have nearly as many species. And one of the favorites, of course, are the dragonflies. They're gorgeous and they fly during the day, they're colorful, they're big, and there are guidebooks that will teach you all about them. <laughs> they are they also have complete and incomplete metamorphosis, um, but their larval stage is in the water. And then they emerge from the water and they've got wings. They have no pupa kind of stage. These are all predators too. And they're little cousins, the damselflies. They're smaller, they fly slower, but they're still predators. Um, they tend to stay lower to the ground and they're probably one of our best mosquito controls. Um, they feed on mosquitoes at the surface of the water, they feed at them on them around your ankles when you're walking on a path. Um, damselflies are always eating mosquitoes because mosquitoes don't fly real fast either and they stay low to the ground. Another group of insects that might be kind of under the radar of a lot of people are called the Neuroptera, the nerve-winged insects, which is kind of a silly name because lots of insects have big wings with a lot of little veins in them. Um, the green lace wings are probably the most commonly seen. All these are predators and they feed on other insects. Uh, the antlion larva is the little doodle bug that's in the sand in the cones. And the, it's up in the, this is what an adult antlion looks like. And you hardly ever see them. They look something like a damselfly, but um, they hide unless you stare them out and then they fly a little bit. There are other groups of insects, of course. You might have been wondering when I get to everybody's favorites, <laughs> which are cockroaches. <laughs> okay, earwigs are a separate order all by themselves. Cockroaches and termites are very closely related. And in fact, at one time, all three of these were in the same group along with grasshoppers and, uh, and mantises and other things. Then they were separated out. Now they've with DNA studies, they've recombined cockroaches and termites. They are that closely related. The, the walking sticks are another order of insects. These, of course, are not terribly common. Their, their main defense is camouflage. They hide from everything. Um, the only one that's got a defense is this one. It's called the prairie alligator or the two-striped walking stick. It has little glands behind its head and can shoot out a venom if it's in defense. And it's supposedly very irritating to the eyes. Another order that's related is the mantises. Although we have several species around here, the main one you're going to see is going to be the Carolina mantis. And that one, the, the male, this is the male, can fly. The females are big and their wings are too short. They can't fly, but they come in different colors. So right now you'll only see babies around, but towards the end of the summer, you'll start seeing the big ones. And they're predators, of course. Then we get to the ones that they're all related to, the, the orthoptera, which are the crickets, katydids, and grasshoppers. So crickets are more than just a field cricket. There are all kinds of crickets. 
Um, they come in different colors. They come from green to brown to black colors. Um, they can sing. The males have specialized wings that they can rub together to make the singing sound. Also, these all have very long, thin antennas. And they're very closely related to katydids, which also have long, thin antennas. <laughs> and so this, may, this way you can tell these are not grasshoppers, even though some of these are brown and some are green. Um, this is also a good time to point out, when you see something long sticking out the back end of any insect, it's not a stinger. And that's true for wasps too. If it sticks out and you can see it, it's not a stinger, it's an egg laying appendage. It's the ovipositor. A stinger that's used to really deliver a sting is always hidden until it's used. So you're just always left wondering. The other part of the Orthoptera, of course, are the grasshoppers. And they have short antennas. They've also got much better um, color vision because they're. Um, diurnal, which means they're active during the day. And so when you go walking on a trail and you see the grasshoppers flying and the colors on them, that's part of their evolution is that they are definitely daytime flyers and they rely on sight a lot. And all of these, of course, have chewing mouth parts. So grasshoppers, when they damage plants, they eat the whole plant generally. <laughs> okay, so what are insects good for? They, do, they perform a lot of services for us that we don't even think about. Um, the aeration of soil is very important because otherwise soil would eventually get compacted. One of the main things that aerates it are subterranean insects. All kinds of insects burrow, they make nests down there. Also waste recycling, and that's not just dung, like these dung beetles are plowing into, but also dead wood, that's what termites do. Um, all the dead vegetation that cellulose is very hard to break down, but these use gut bacteria to help um, get rid of it. Of course, the food web, and that's a very generalized version of what insects are. are. I mean, they, insects eat other insects, they get eaten, they eat plants. They're a major part of how the sun's energy is turned into life on this planet. And because insects are so diverse and so ubiquitous in the environment, they're a major part of that energy resource. And then pollination is probably one of the main things we think about with insects. And when insects pollinate, it, um, they, they and flowers evolve together. That's the only reason that plants have flowers is because of in flying insects to pollinate them. You'll sometimes see relationships between various insects and other small arthropods like spiders. Ants are one of the more common things that are just, they're very, they have a lot of relationships with other insects. In this case, they're staying around plant feeding hoppers like tree hoppers and mealybugs because as those little plant feeders feed, they produce honeydew which is just a nice way of saying sweet pea. And the ants like to lick it up. <laughs> and so they'll protect those and stay with them. Because ants are well protected, they have, um, they have formic acid in their bodies, which makes them distasteful. A bunch of them have stings. Um, about 50% of our ant species can sting. And they also are in great numbers. So tiny things. This is our tiniest longhorn beetle, and it is ant-sized. Even spiders will mimic ants. This true bug is a nymph, and it looks just like an ant, except you can see that proboscis. That's how it feeds. Ants have jaws. So things like aposematic coloring, the when something looks like a lady beetle, and lady beetles don't taste good. They have chemicals in them that make them distasteful, and that's why they're orange and black most of the time. This golden tortoise beetle normally looks like this, but if you scare it, it suddenly looks like this. In about a second, it can get rid of that gold liquid in its, in its um, exoskeleton and show the underlying colors to protect it from predators. On the top are two longhorn beetles, one of which mimics a wasp and the other mimics the very poisonous fireflies. 
the same chemicals that light up a firefly also would make you very sick if you ate it. <laughs> so if you have a pet lizard, do not feed them fireflies. So insects are animals, they're wildlife. And we don't think of that until you see something like this where there's a, this is a, a fly that you see and then all of a sudden you realize, oh my gosh, there's a crab spider. It's eating that fly, that fly is dead. Then another fly landed. It wanted to have a nice meal of pollen too, but then it sees this fly acting weird and it just doesn't like that idea. So it decided to take action and try and get rid of that fly, but of course it didn't happen. Notice that the spider is still just there. Eventually the live fly left and the spider just continued its meal. So you will see insects that doing all sorts of normal things that animals do. Um, these are all wasps, the gathering building materials. How do paper wasps make paper nests? Well, they have to gather the wood fibers first. Um, adult wasps feed on sweet stuff like nectar from flowers or soda pop from your can. Um, if they're hunting for their babies because their babies need, um, they need animal prey to, to develop. Whereas bees are vegetarian, wasps aren't. Um, and sometimes on hot summer days, you will see wasps coming to drink. So you'll always see insects eating and spiders. I mean, they're just, they're constantly going to be eating. And there's, hmm, I'm getting some distraction sounds. So sorry about the weird sounds. Um, when you have herbivorous insects, those that eat plants, they're eating all the time. Grasshoppers and caterpillars are great examples. And you can see them just chomping away if you're watching them. Spiders and true bugs suck liquid out of their prey. And so they take a long time to eat. So you often will see them too. But things like mantises, they have jaws, they chew up their prey. That mantis will finish off that butterfly in a few minutes. So it's not as common to actually see them eating. It's interesting to see if the, what they're eating is bigger or smaller than themselves. The black widow and scorpion is like one of these, who's going to win you know, out of two lethal animals? Well, the, the scorpion is bigger and it has a good stinger, but the black widow has a web and spider webs are one of the most efficient tools for predation there is. And predators are all general. They don't specifically eat just one thing. They eat what they can catch and the tables can be turned. At one point, the spider could be the predator. In the next moment, it might be the prey. This happens with lady beetles. Um, it's, we are used to lady beetles eating aphids. This is a larva. These are lady beetle eggs. So if you see these, you know what you've got in your garden. Here though, we've got a larva eating a pupa of a lady beetle. Hmm, it just happened to come across it and felt hungry. This lady beetle is eating lady beetle eggs. They could have even been her own. Um, she might have gone away, gotten hungry, and come back for a snack. Sometimes the lady beetles are the prey. And so it just, predation is very general and it's a predator will catch and eat whatever it can. You will see insects mating and they mate in different ways, especially dragonflies and damselflies have that real position, which is kind of interesting. Even if the insects are different sizes, such as those grasshoppers, they're still mating. That's not a baby on the back of that female. Ovipositing is egg laying. And so after insects mate, they lay eggs. The females have to find a place to lay the eggs. They will choose a hopefully a safe place or a place where the young will have something to eat when they hatch out. Not very many insects stay with their eggs after they're laid, but a few do, just it's not really common. Okay, I mentioned about molting between stages. Every time an, any arthropod grows or starts or has to um, shed its or change its shape, like when they molt for pupation, um, they have to shed their skin. So this is one of the big leaf-footed bugs we have in the area. It doesn't have a common name, even though you would think it would. They're stinky, but they're not really stink bugs. 
this is one that has just shed its skin. So it's a different color and it's soft. You can see how the wing is soft like that. Here's the shed skin. When they shed, they shed the tracheal tubes, which are its breathing tubes that go into its body. It sheds its digestive system. All of that has to be molted. Then the insect's very soft. So this is like your soft shell crab sandwich. And it has to sit for a while. This one will take a couple hours to harden to get to this point. So I will show you some kind of cheap home movies of an insect molting. This is a grasshopper nymph. And they use gravity to pull themselves out of their shell. And it keeps looking like it's going to fall. And then those long legs come out. But then it grabs on at the last minute. So it doesn't fall on the ground. <laughs> and it can sit there and wait. And so it tries to stay very still while it's doing this because it's at this point it's soft. And if one of its legs get bent, it might not be able to molt the next time or it might even cause it to not be able to move correctly. And I'll show another one coming out. If anybody's seen one of these, they, they know what's coming. This is a cicada nymph. And they're, you know, this time of year is when you start looking for them. If you find one crawling up your house on the outside at dusk, you can bring them inside, and the best thing, I put them on a lampshade to watch them, and it takes a long time. It takes about 20 minutes for them to emerge from their shell, and then it takes quite a long time before they're ready to fly. So they split down the back. So this right here is the split where the shell has, gone, has opened up, and gravity will pull it out first. It's also kind of pumping its body to let it pull out from the shell. And just when it looks like it's going to fall, it reaches back up to grab on. You can see the little wings here. They're still really tiny. But then it's going to sit, and the wings start to pump up. It pumps liquid in, and then it takes it out. So then they have to dry. So at this stage, a large insect like this is going to sit for quite a while. Um, my dogs that I've always had love cicadas. and I sometimes give them a treat at this point, or they jump up and get it, or <laughs> that's, so they're obviously very edible. The same thing happens with spiders, but spiders have one more kind of advantage. They can use a line of silk to hold themselves as they shed. So this one is pulling its legs out, out, out. It's got long legs. And then it doesn't have to hold on, so it doesn't have to hurt those legs. And it can even stretch and kind of make sure all the joints work well while it's hanging there. Okay, so there are just a couple of things I want to point out about challenges that insects face. Of course, there's habitat destruction. So, I mean, on the big scale where you just wipe out all the vegetation and stuff, yeah, there's, that's going to hurt the diversity of insects. But even on a small scale, a yard that is reduced down to nothing but a St. Augustine grass carpet doesn't have a whole lot of diversity for anything to live in. And if you have enough places like that, it reduces the amount of space for these animals to live in. You might think, how can beautiful flowers be a danger to insects? Well, if they're in the wrong place, they can be. Cultivars are developed by humans. They're not take, nothing is taken into consideration about the quality of the nectar, the suitability as a host plant, um, how nutritious the pollen might be. And those are all things that insects rely on as part of the food web. And when you put an exotic plant in a place where it doesn't have any use in the ecosystem, it simply doesn't really do anything. It's, it's kind of a dead end. There was nothing flying around these. This happened to be tulips at Zilker Gardens one year. <laughs> and of course, everybody knows we can't grow tulips here in Texas. It's not the right climate. Um, but it's kind of eerie to not see any bees or anything in them. And of course, the one thing you want to stay away from is general pesticides. Um, when you kill off all insects, that includes the predators as well as the ones that might bend the pest. Who's going to come back first? Well, it's almost invariably the, the pest ones come back first, and it takes a while before the predators do. So if you're really wanting to get rid of insects 
you know, any specific kind that say is eating your tomatoes, the best way is first just squish them with your fingers or, you know, some other way, <laughs> or using, say, something non-lethal to wipe aphids off, like water with some soap in it, um, but trying to avoid the use of pesticides. Okay, so that kind of wraps it up. And so we'll turn it over to, I'll stop the screen share, and then we can do questions and answers. Okay, there's a ton of good information there, Val. Thank you very much for that. A lot um, of it. <laughs> yeah. our, our first question, uh, and if anybody else has any questions in the thing, feel free to post it in chat right now, and we'll start going through those. Um, the first question some folks had were about the map that they showed at the very beginning. I posted the link to the map uh, online. Check that out, and you can look around at the tracks there. Um, the first question came from Tom Delaney, and he asked, um, can you discuss the false ladybug that bites and how to tell the difference? Okay. Um, lady, it's probably not a false ladybug. There is one ladybug species that or Janus that is a plant feeder, but they don't bite. Ladybugs do bite. They have little jaws and they will sometimes nip you. I mean, it's amazing how those tiny jaws can get a grip and bite, but they're simply doing it in self-defense. Um, ladybugs don't, they're not after us. They don't really hurt us and they don't want to eat us. It's just a reaction. So unless they're drawing blood, which wouldn't be, <laughs> a ladybug's too small to do that. Um, that's probably what they are. And we have a lot of different kinds of ladybugs. So we have, they run from about two millimeters long up to the ones that are the regular size. And yet they're not very big. Great. Um, the next question we have, and this is a good one, we get asked quite a bit, is uh, last year we had a bunch of lightning bugs. This year we haven't seen any. What, some reasons behind that? They, the, the fireflies rely on the habitat to be good during their larval stage. As larvae, they are predators in gardens in the ground, and they need moist um, habitat. And I noticed I haven't seen them either around much. Part of it is that I haven't been outside visiting people <laughs> in the evenings like I was, and it might just be that we're not out enough to be seeing them. Something about the way the weather pattern has gone, they're simply not as common. And this, they come and go like that. A lot of insects are common one year, not the next year. It varies tremendously. So it'll have to do with weather patterns and they may show up more later in the, the year. Cool. Um, next was um, referring to damselflies. Is there a way that I can entice more, more of them onto my property? <laughs> okay, the, the best way is to be near permanent water where they breed. Um, they, ha they always stay close to their little creeks and things. When I put in a garden pond, one of the first things that ended up in there were damselflies. Uh, you have, it's, the problem is you've got to start off with something that will take care of mosquito larvae, which will be the first thing to show up, and you can't just like clean it all out. And so I've, a pond with small fish like minnows and a lot of vegetation helps tremendously for damselflies. That's their best habitat. Cool. All right. Um, so there's a bunch of questions popping up now. So I'm just going to keep firing until you okay. tell me to stop or Kate tells us that we're out of time. So okay. um, the next one is, are, are there invasive ladybugs? Um, two of our most common species are not native. Um, the seven spotted and the Asian, the multicolored Asian. And so they could be considered invasive, but we still have a number of native species, but they do compete. Cool. Um, another one, their son wants to know if millipedes are good for the earth. So. Are good for what? Are, if millipedes are good for the earth. So. Oh, yes. I mean, they, in fact, they are one of the aerating or animals. Um, they are part of the food chain. Whenever you pick up a rock, you'll find millipedes under it. <laughs> it's very common. And they, and when they die, of course, they decompose back into, you know, their, their elemental parts. So anything that lives and dies in the ground tends to be good at rejuvenating the soil. Awesome. 
Um, this one's interesting is, will praying mantises actually kill hummingbirds? I've, I've heard this before as a myth, but uh, what's your oh, take? Yes. Mm -hmm. If they can catch them, they, they certainly would. Um, it is not pleasant to see. Mantises tend to go for the eyes first. And I've, I haven't actually seen it myself, but I've seen videos of it. And I, there are plenty of recorded um, instances of them waiting at feeders or even just catching the birds. Um, when they catch a hummingbird, for some reason, the hummingbirds often stop struggling as if they go into shock. And then, yes, the mantis will eat it. Okay. Um, let's see. How do insects survive the winter and come back out in the spring? Most, of, okay, down here, they don't have to worry about that. <laughs> There's always places to hide where they're, they have to not freeze. And some insects can, of course, deal with freezes because at a certain stage in their life, they have antifreeze in their bodies. So it might be the egg or the pupa or even a larval stage. Some even do it as adults. And they just, they can actually withstand below freezing temperatures without actually freezing. And around here, we are at the freeze line um, we haven't had hard freezes in Austin for a few winters now. They, the hill country still gets them, but we haven't here. And certain insects that used to die off during the winter are continuing on, um, which is what is making the flea problem worse. We're having more wasp nests that don't die. Chiggers come back faster. <laughs> so. All right, next up was, uh, what's the, what can you tell us about the tawny crazy ants situation? Um. I haven't heard more about that. We had a nest right about two blocks from my house a few months ago. Um, they're a problem in Houston. They have established themselves. And I haven't heard much more about them in Austin. And we do have native crazy ants. And to tell you the truth, I can't tell the difference when I'm looking at a specimen. They're very, very similar. The, the native crazy ants are not in huge numbers. So supposedly the best way to tell a tawny crazy ant is that it is, you've got millions of them, but that's kind of a bad time to find them <laughs> if they're already around. Um, they supposedly outcompete um, fire ants just because of sheer numbers, but crazy ants don't sting or anything. They're just extremely testy because there's so many of them. I can actually chime in. This is Johanna from Travis County Balcones okay. Preserve and um, the city of Austin and Travis County are actually working with um, UT right now, Dr. Ed Lebrun there to study the tiny crazy ants because they could really be a big issue here in Austin um, both ecologically and for people in their homes um, and I'll actually post a link to a video that's all about that effort in the chat over on the side. Thank you. Good deal. This next, next one is a, is a great question. Uh, any studies on the mosquito misting systems impacts? Says my neighbors use the services and I think it impacts my habitat in my backyard. And what are your thoughts on that? Well, it absolutely does. <laughs> it's, um, yeah, it's, it's a general way to kill off flying insects and that includes everything. So that mist does not just kill mosquitoes. It's going to wipe out a good portion of the diversity. Um, and that's, but we have a problem because mosquitoes do carry diseases. One of the better ways to protect yourself from mosquitoes would be to use um, insect repellent on your arms and also avoid being out at dusk and dawn when they're most active. Most of the time you don't need to worry about them late at night or during the full day. They're just not as bad. Um, but the mosquito spraying is, yeah, it definitely will affect the whole ecosystem because of that. Okay. We've had several people ask, um, what is your favorite insect? And then several people ask, uh, any books that you would recommend, field guides, etc., that you'd want people to check out? Okay. Um, I don't have a favorite insect because my favorite thing is taxonomy, which is the study of classification. So the fact that there are thousands of insects is what I like the best. <laughs> and I like the variety and the fact that I'm always finding new ones that I've never seen. Um, the best books, um, the best one is actually the Kaufman uh, Field Guide. I should have 
kept one handy here to show you, but um, the, it's the Field Guide to North American Insects. There is a Texas insect book that I think will eventually be published, but it's not out yet. Um, it's still in the works. And when that comes out, that would be a big help. Um, I also, the little folding guides that you can, it used to be in HEB stores, but you can get them at um, bookstores and at um, nurseries and stuff. They have, there's one, the spiders of Texas, and I've done the butterflies of central Texas, and also unusual insects of Texas. I put that, I, the publisher did that one for me, um, and that one is good because it covers categories that aren't usually covered much in other guides. Things like different kinds of cockroaches, stick insects, and caddisflies and things. Okay. Um, we're, we're getting pretty close to the end of the submitted ones here, so I think we could finish them up. It's, uh, one of them was, what happens to insects during the flash flood if they're in a, like a flash zone, flood zone? They either drown, <laughs> or they get washed away, or they manage to do things like, if anybody's ever seen fire ants floating on the water, the whole colony kind of makes a ball and they float. Oh, so yeah, in flash floods, it does clean out the insects from an area, but they often just go somewhere or hang on to plants. Sometimes they can just hang on and survive it. But if you go through a flash flood area at, shortly after, you'll find that there are fewer things around, but it doesn't take long for them to come back. And then um, what is the frequency of molting? I, I think this probably depends on the insect, but do you have a... Yeah, it... it um, it often it has to do with temperature and humidity. If an insect is able to be active as it's growing, like say a caterpillar, if it hatches and everything is perfect, it's going to molt every couple of days as it grows. If things are bad, like it's too hot and dry or it's cold and it can't feed, it might be a week or two between molts. So it's all dependent on external um, factors. But most insects have either very short life cycles and just continuous, or they have a one year life cycle, part of which they spend dormant. Like there are certain insects that are only active for about two months of the year, the rest of the time they spend as an egg or a pupa or something. Okay, and then the final submitted question, and this one's a pretty large one, so we'll see. What, um, what are some of the best native plant species to plant to attract bees, butterflies, dragonflies? Etc. Okay, the best things would be if you want flowers year round. The more the more you can have staggered bloom periods, the better. So there are fall bloomers, blooming plants like right now things like flame acanthus is great. In the fall, frost wheat is great. Um, they're they're just oh my gosh, there's so many. You want something starting in the early spring, and if you have a succession of blooming plants, that's your ideal and better yet would be to leave a lot of weeds around them because the, as much as we think of them as weeds that's diversity in flowers and even those tiniest little flowers that are down on the ground like oxalis and um, straggler daisy those all are fed, they're feeding pollinating insects and other things that feed on them so the more diversity you can have the better That's a short answer for a big question. <laughs> yeah, we could probably have a, a talk just on that. Yeah. But that, that wraps up all the submitted questions. Uh, Kate, do you have anything you'd like to close with? No, I was just going to say thank you so much, Val, for sharing all of that knowledge with us. Thanks to Jeremy for moderating questions and to this group for not only great questions, but I see in the chat some good suggestions, too, about using iNaturalist and using other guides. Um, yeah. Thanks for experimenting with, with Zoom with us. It was really nice to, to share this with everyone. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Val. This was so wonderful. <laughs> okay, bye-bye. Okay, bye, -bye. okay bye. bye everyone.